If you walk through a wet market in Penang, chances are you will hear people talking in Penang Hokkien. The same is if you visit a night market, a shopping mall, or walk through the streets of Georgetown. It is common to hear people talking, discussing, bargaining, telling jokes, laughing in Penang Hokkien in a language they could not write. Whatever is done in Penang Hokkien is done orally. When the need arises for these people to commit something in writing, they would switch to another language, be it English, Mandarin, or Malay. Have you ever thought, has it ever crossed your mind, why doesn't anybody learn to write Penang Hokkien? Surely, out of the thousands of people in Penang who speak Penang Hokkien, someone would know how to write the language, right? Well, the truth is, nobody learned to write Penang Hokkien because there was no writing system for the language. There was none, at least not until 2013. It does not mean that there was no attempt to write the language. There were plenty, but none ever took hold. Up to today, whenever a person needs to write something in Penang Hokkien, he is forced to spell the word, phrase or sentence in whichever spelling that makes sense to him. This ad hoc writing system requires another person who understands Penang Hokkien to decipher and make sense of what was written. There is no dictionary to unlock this spell as you please method as every word could be spelled in a myriad number of ways. Needless to say, this is a huge disservice to Penang Hokkien, especially in this present age where the bulk of social communication has transitioned into the written form onto Facebook, WhatsApp, WeChat, and emails. Without a proper writing system, Penang Hokkien is handicapped. It loses out to languages that can be written. Every time we have to use a different language in place of Penang Hokkien, because Penang Hokkien just couldn't do the job, our language moves a step back. Step by step, Penang Hokkien is taking the slow move to oblivion. The day will come when Penang Hokkien becomes so obscure, so unnecessary, that local society moves on without it. When that day comes, a big chunk of our identity and our culture die with it. That is an absolute calamity. For Penang Hokkien predates Penang. It arrived in this region long before Captain Francis Light planted the British flag on what he called the Prince of Wales Island. The language has been around from day one until present day. When we invented our Penang Hokkien food, it was there. When we created our Nyonya cuisine, it was there. When we erected the buildings in our heritage site, it was there. Everything that makes us, us, be it our food, our heritage sites, our Baba Nyonya culture, everything was created in the presence of Penang Hokkien. Without Penang Hokkien, our identity has lost its heart. I know, I can see the urgency that many of you do not want Penang Hokkien to die. But how do we save our language? We are talking about something so fluid, so invisible, so intangible, and though so many of us use it every single day, we know so little about. How do we save something we know so little about? Well, for want of a better person, I step forward. If nobody else could do it, or would do it, I would. I will do the research, I will find out. If there is no writing system, I will create one. If there is no dictionary, I will create one. If there are no means to learn, I will create one. And then, I will share the knowledge with you, so that knowledge of this language we hold so dear will start to grow. At the end of the day, I know I can't do it all myself. A living language is like a virus, it needs a host. If the knowledge stays with me, it dies with me. But if I can propagate it to you and you to someone else, our language has a better chance to survive. But to propagate our language in this 21st century, we need to have the willingness to adapt. Penang Hokkien is a living thing. 
it needs to breathe, to grow, and to evolve. If we keep it frozen in time, it will fossilize. And the most radical move to ensure Penang Hokkien survival is to transition it from a largely oral language into one that has a proper writing system. We don't create writing systems for the sake of having one. We do it for it is essential for the survival of our language. We should be pragmatic in our approach and the writing system should reflect the practicalities of present times. Getting a writing system for Penang Hokkien is the main topic of this video. I am addressing it here because it's an issue that is littered with many false starts. But this time, let's do it right. Let's start our story here. In front of us is the Farquhar Street Mission House in Georgetown, Penang. It is the remainder of what used to be an ensemble of two buildings used by Protestant Christian believers as their place of worship and assembly in the 19th century to the early 20th century. In front of this building was the Mission Chapel which has since been demolished to make way for the widening of Farquhar Street. The history of early Protestant missionaries in Penang holds some fascination to me because my late mother, when she was only a small girl, used to attend services here with her mother and grandmother. That was before the assembly relocated to a new site now known as Burma Road Gospel Hall. Subsequent church planting moved our family to Allen Glitz Gospel Center and eventually to Sungai Nibong Gospel Hall. But what does all that have to do with the Hokkien language? The answer to that is, it was through Protestant church activities which led to the creation of the first writing system by English-speaking missionaries and it had its start not in China, but rather in Malacca and subsequently Penang and Singapore, which were collectively known as the Strip Settlements. In the early 19th century, there was a zeal among Protestant missionaries in England to spread the gospel to the Far East, particularly to China. It was an interdenominational movement within an organization called the London Missionary Society. There were believers from the Congregationalist Church, from the Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, and other Protestants. Among the leading figures include Samuel Dyer, Hudson Taylor, Walter Henry Matthews, and Robert Morrison, who was buried at this cemetery in Macau, which I had the chance to visit. Many of these missionaries used the Strait Settlements as their stepping stone to China. It was here, initially in Malacca, then Penang and Singapore, that the missionaries made first contact with Chinese people. What they discover at times confirmed their understanding of the Chinese people and at times left them totally astonished. The first thing they found out was that the Chinese in Malacca and Penang were almost entirely illiterate. That did not come as a surprise, considering it was already common knowledge that most of the migrants were coolies and those from the bottom rung of society. They were from southern China, particularly the provinces of Fujian and Guangdong. These migrants spoke a variety of dialects. Among the Hokkien's, there were at least two different variants depending on which city the migrants hailed from. The Teochews likewise had at least two different variants, as did the Cantonese. Yet, within this very plural society, a language has emerged as the lingua franca. That is the variant of Hokkien that originated from the port city of Changzhou, which would evolve into present-day Penang Hokkien. Among this mass of Chinese migrants in Malacca and Penang, a very minute percentage was able to read and write. They were the very cream of 19th century Penang's Chinese community, so few in numbers that they could be individually named. These were the people from the merchant class, the business owners who brought the coolies in. They needed literacy in order to keep lock of their commerce, to communicate with their government back in China, 
and for organizing the feast to worship their ancestors and patron saints. What astonished the missionaries was that these people who were able to read and write were not reading and writing in the same language they spoke. The sentence structure for the written text differs from that of the spoken language. And when they read the written text, they would pronounce many words differently from how they would pronounce them when speaking. Yet, among those who profess to be Hokkien, when asked, they maintained that they were reading Hokkien. Needless to say, those with the ability to read and write were the privileged few, the elites. The rest of the Chinese people in 19th century Malacca and Penang remained blissfully illiterate. The next baffling discovery made by the missionaries was that the same text that was read by the Hokkien's could also be read by the Teochews and the Cantonese, each pronouncing the text in his own way. The Teochews would read the text in what the Teochews would call the Teochew reading pronunciation, and the Cantonese would do the same in the Cantonese reading pronunciation. At that point, it dawned on the missionaries that there exists a uniform text that could be read by the Hokkien's, Teochews, Cantonese, and other groups of Chinese people that gained literacy in Chinese, each in his own reading pronunciation that differs from the speaking pronunciation. Since it could be read by different groups of Chinese people, and since it was used specifically for written communication, that mysterious text was given the name Literary Chinese. Through Literary Chinese, the Chinese people could communicate among themselves, albeit in written form, enabling the bureaucrats of Mandarin to govern the sprawling empire. Even at that time in the 19th century, the Mandarins, hailing from Beijing, was using a language which later became known as Mandarin, but the learning of this language was not widespread. Beyond the Mandarin-speaking parts of China, there weren't schools that taught in the Mandarin dialect, so the local leaders in different provinces continued to speak in their local dialects and if they should learn to read, do so in their local reading pronunciation. Now, going back to the purpose that brought the missionaries to Malacca and Penang, it was of course to spread the gospel. But for the scriptures to reach the people, it has to be written in their language. Missionaries like Robert Morrison was translating the Bible into the Mandarin dialect, a colloquial language or dialect that was quite widespread throughout China, even before the introduction of vernacular written Mandarin. But it's a completely different language from the one spoken by the Chinese in Malacca and Penang, almost all of whom were illiterate, and the Bible written in literary Chinese is also of no use to them. Trying to teach these new converts literary Chinese in order for them to read the Bible is also too tall an order. At a time when audio recording has not yet been invented, the written text was the only means of preserving communication. The only way to get the Bible to these people was to do it in their spoken language. But the spoken language has no written form. As it usually was, necessity was the mother of all inventions. And so, to get the gospel to the illiterate masses, the missionaries embarked on a gargantuan mission to invent a writing system for the Hokkien language. But they immediately encountered an issue. The Hokkien-speaking Chinese in Malacca speak a different variant of Hokkien from those in Penang. On top of that, there was also a smaller group of Chinese in Malacca who called themselves the Peranakan, who spoke Malay peppered with Hokkien words similar to the variants spoken in Penang. To create a writing system for each group is simply too much work for too few people. There had to be a compromise. That compromise came in the form of the Amoy dialect, which has elements of the Changchou dialect used in Penang and Chenchou dialect used in Malacca and the southern part of the Malay Peninsula. The choice of Amoy dialect was obvious because by then, 
Changzhou was in decline, while Amoy, now President Xiamen, was on the rise. In due course, the variant of Hokkien spoken in Amoy became the prestige form, the future standard Hokkien. With the variant of Hokkien decided, the missionaries proceeded to create a Romanized writing system to write spoken Hokkien. It's much easier to teach the illiterate 26 letters of the alphabet than the hundreds of Chinese characters required to read literary Chinese. As far as possible, the writing system has to be phonetically faithful. In other words, there is a fixed way to spell, and how it is spelled is how it will be pronounced. In contrast, English is not phonetically faithful. The A in father sounds very different from the A in cat. That worked for English, but the priority of the missionaries was to create a writing system that is phonetically faithful so that it is easy for their intended students to learn. So, every single letter can only be pronounced a single way, not more. Unfortunately, there are more sounds than the letters to represent them. So the alphabet as it is, is inadequate to represent all the sounds in spoken Hokkien. For example, the O in Go and the one in Four are different. It doesn't matter in English where each letter may represent more than one sound. But the missionaries were insistent that each letter in their system should represent only one sound. They were also against using digraphs, that is to say, stringing two letters together to represent a sound, or trigraphs stringing three. Therefore, they need more letters. Their solution was to create new letters. The O in Go will be spelled with O, while the O in Four is spelled with an O, followed by a dot at one o'clock. Therefore, Four is spelled like this. Such a move would be a nightmare in the present context as it would require supporting software, but the missionaries have no qualms for such a solution, for it all took place at an age before even typewriters were prevalent. Its intended users will be writing it by hand. When you handwrite, it's no problem to introduce new characters or diacritic marks. The missionaries could not have imagined that a hundred years down the road, people will be communicating using keyboards and keypads, and the special characters they invented will become a stumbling block. And, considering the writing system was created for church use, it became known as church romanization. But over time, it found its way into circular use because there was indeed a need to write spoken Hokkien, and the missionary system is by far superior to any other option. As church romanization was invented with the objective to write the spoken or colloquial Hokkien, it became known as the colloquial writing system, which is Pei Ji in Kaohsiung, Pei Wei Li in Xiamen, Quanzhou, and Taipei, and Pei Wa Ji in Changzhou. In Penang Hokkien, it is also pronounced Pei Wa Ji and written as Pei Wa Ji using the modern Taiji romanization. And while it is true that church romanization was created to write the colloquial or lower register of the Hokkien language, it could also be used to represent the pronunciation of the literary or upper register. So, to call it colloquial writing system is not entirely accurate. What is more accurate is to call it a phonetic alphabet, similar to Han Yu Pinyin, a system to represent sounds. As you can see, even in its very name, Pat Weiji, that church romanization uses diacritic marks. Using A as the carrier vowel, the marks are as shown. On top of that, it also uses the unit O with a dot and the superscript N. Some of these diacritic marks look like those in Han Yi Pinyin, however, they do not represent the same sound. Take the A with the grave accent for example. In Han Yi Pinyin, it is pronounced A, ah, whereas in church romanization, it is pronounced A. Ah. 
Without training, a person who is familiar with Han Yi pinyin will mispronounce texts written in church romanization. Nonetheless, in the absence of a better option, church romanization remained the most common system for writing the Hokkien language for over a hundred years. Between the time when Walter Matthes published his dictionary in 1832 until the 20th century, the system did undergo some modification, but has remained largely unchanged for much of the 20th century. If you get your hands on text in church romanization, you will notice that it leans towards the Amoy dialect, also known as the Xiamen variant of the Hokkien language. With some modification, it can be used to write different variants of Hokkien, including Penang Hokkien. However, its role is very much that of a phonetic alphabet, which is to represent the sounds of different Hokkien dialects. The choice of using the Amoy dialect for the bulk of written text in church romanization is a compromise as explained earlier. But it's also because Xiamen became one of the treaty ports following the 1842 Treaty of Nanking, which forced China to open such ports to foreign traders. This enabled Western missionaries to set up base there and engage in mission work among the locals. It elevated the importance of Xiamen and its dialect became the standard which spread to other places where Hokkien is spoken, most notably Taiwan. However, Penang is far removed from Xiamen and so the influence of Xiamen dialect to Penang is minimal. The Hokkien speaking population of Penang remains illiterate in the language, with the exception of churchgoers of the Hokkien speaking assemblies, where Hokkien Bibles printed in the Amoy dialect are used. While Hokkien speaking services do exist in the churches in Penang today, they are a shrinking remnant that is gradually being replaced by the Mandarin speaking services. The Hokkien language remained a largely vernacular tongue in Penang and elsewhere right into the 20th century. In Taiwan, after decades of being suppressed in favor of Mandarin, Taiwanese Hokkien finally received a new lease on life following the lifting of martial law in 1987. It enables scholars of Taiwanese Hokkien to work on researching and developing the language. In the course of doing that, they met with several decision points, for example, what to call this language and how to write it. The language is often called Tai Yi in Mandarin, Tai Gi or Tai Gu depending on the variant of Hokkien, and Taiwanese in English, but many do not like that name because the language is not native to Taiwan. It was brought in from mainland China. Some call it Southern Min or Minan, and that's the name used by Taiwan's Ministry of Education, but that too is not completely accurate because Minan is not one language, but a family of languages that includes Teochew. To call it Minan belittles Teochew's position as one of the Minan languages. So, for want of a better name, I call it Taiwanese Hokkien as it is the Taiwan type of the Hokkien language. Even so, Taiwanese Hokkien is not one uniform language, but is composed of various dialects or variants. The pronunciation in Taipei, for example, is different to that in Kaohsiung as well as in Tainan and other places in Taiwan. Nonetheless, the Taipei pronunciation is considered the standard or prestige form. How to write the language and how to represent its phonology is yet another area mired in disagreements, though not so much in Taiwan. As the population of Taiwan is generally familiar with Chinese characters, it is not a big issue to adopt the use of Chinese characters for writing Taiwanese Hokkien. It should however be noted that writing vernacular Taiwanese Hokkien using Chinese characters is a new development. In the past, the written form of Hokkien has always been in the literary register. The spoken language could be assigned their characters from the literary register, but it has always remained oral until church romanization was invented. Therefore, writing the vernacular Taiwanese Hokkien using Chinese characters follows the same path taken to develop vernacular Mandarin into modern standard Mandarin. Although church romanization was the most popular romanization scheme, 
the Linguistic Society of Taiwan nevertheless devised the Taiwanese Language Phonetic Alphabet or TLPA in the late 1990s. And for a while, this was adopted by the Taiwan Ministry of Education as the official romanization scheme between 1998 and 2006. The advantage of TLPA is that it does not use any special characters. Also, tones are represented by tone numbers similar to Taiji romanization. However, TLPA faced opposition from those who have learned church romanization and preferred the old system. So in 2006, a compromise was achieved by adopting elements from church romanization and TLPA. This new writing system is called Taiwanese Romanization or simply Tai Lo. It is worth noting that TLPA was retired not because it is inferior to church romanization, but rather because it was opposed by those who are accustomed to church romanization. The newly created Tai Lo retains the same diacritic marks from church romanization. However, it does away with the special characters. For example, the O dot is written as OO, while the superscript N is written as NN. Some proponents of the Hokkien language in Penang received the introduction of Tai Lo with much enthusiasm, but not all. Those who objected to its use, chief among them myself, considers Tai Lo culturally incompatible to Penang Hokkien. It was not developed with Penang Hokkien in mind. As such, it could not be read intuitively by speakers of Penang Hokkien. But the majority of Penang Hokkien speakers do not understand the matter deep enough to be horrified by this cultural intrusion and many blindly support any available move to save Penang Hokkien. Those who understand the issue will see the introduction of Tai Lo as the first step towards killing off Penang Hokkien, opening the gates for Taiwanese influence to erode its unique characteristics. For example, speakers of Penang Hokkien are quite likely to mispronounce the O O in Tai Lo. Tai Lo also differs in the spelling of some words to church romanization, and the location of the diacritic marks are also often different. On top of that, some of these diacritic marks look like those in Han Yu Pinyin, but are not pronounced the same way. Therefore, Tai Lo is a minefield to those untrained to read it. Some of the changes in spelling from church romanization to Tai Lo are seen as arbitrary, and arguments that these are done to achieve greater accuracy in pronunciation is also open to debate. Therefore, the introduction of Tai Lo is seen by many as an, an unnecessary impediment on the growth of literacy of the Hokkien language, done for no other reason than to have a writing system specific for Taiwan. In Penang, the Hokkien-speaking population outside a few church circles remain largely illiterate and despite using the language daily their whole life has limited knowledge of its history. But as the use of Penang Hokkien is gradually eroded by the onslaught from Mandarin, many began to register concern that the language may one day be extinct. Among the first persons to take serious action in promoting Penang Hokkien is Tan Chun Ho. His love for the language propelled him to self-publish a series of books in Penang Hokkien which were eventually taken over by MPH. However, Mr. Tan acknowledges his limitations which prevents him from gaining literacy in any of the mainstream Hokkien orthographies. For over half a year, Mr. Tan and I worked together in my study room in an attempt to convert his ad hoc text into Taiji romanization, but the project was eventually put aside when MPH decided that reprinting the, the entire series in Taiji romanization is too costly a venture for a market too small. Considering the exorbitant cost of printing, I decided from the beginning to take a different approach, which is to promote Penang Hokkien without ever publishing any book. By using the internet, I can reach a global audience and I can deliver the language in audio form which would be impossible with printed material. 
When I began work to preserve and develop Penang Hokkien back in 2013, I started from scratch. In the beginning, I was also illiterate in church romanization and Taiwanese romanization, which I would come to learn later. In the beginning, I had comrades in this journey to preserve Penang Hokkien, but we had a falling out, in particular, over the choice of writing system. I could not agree with those who insisted on using Taiwanese romanization to write Penang Hokkien. I held firm to my opinion that Taiwanese romanization has no place in Penang. I was often belittled and mocked because I am not a trained linguist. Detractors would often hurl all forms of insults and criticisms to derail me. But I shut out all the noise and steadfastly continued my task to preserve my mother tongue. The final insult came from a so-called expert of the Hokkien language from New Zealand who alleges that I am promoting my own writing system for monetary gains. I vowed from that moment that I will always teach and promote Penang Hokkien free of charge. These New Zealand linguists also mock my writing system. When I asked for a suggestion of what to call this writing system, she mockingly suggested that since I created it, I should name it after myself. And that's how the writing system became known as Taiji Romanization. The word Taiji is derived from my own surname and means the Thai writing system. I created it in 2013 after having considered and eventually rejecting church romanization and Taiwanese romanization as possible choices for writing Penang Hokkien. I never considered using Chinese characters. Those who are familiar with Chinese characters form a small fraction of the Malaysian population and I want my writing system to be easily learned not only by Mandarin speaking Chinese people but by all Malaysians as well as foreigners. I also want a system that encapsulates the pronunciation of words, so romanization is the preferred choice. Having said that, my Penang Hokkien dictionary shows not only Taiji romanization, but also lists the same word in Chinese characters, church romanization, and Taiwanese romanization, allowing users to do cross-referencing among systems. Taiji romanization was created with the capabilities of our Penang Hokkien speaking people in mind. As they are schooled in English, Malay and Mandarin, I employ elements of these three languages in constructing the writing system. The spelling of Taiji romanization reflects English and Malay spelling, while the tone corresponds to Mandarin tones. Instead of diacritic marks, I use numbers to represent the tones. Traditionally, the Hokkien language is said to have seven different tones. That's because closed syllables are regarded as separate tones. For Penang Hokkien, that is not necessary. When closed syllables are grouped with open syllables, the number of tones can be reduced to five. This reduction is achieved without any loss in meaning or accuracy, yet it makes the writing system less complex to learn. The result is only 5 tones and they are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4 and 3, 3. The 4 single digit tones behave similarly in that they undergo tone changes under specific circumstances. Tone 3, 3 is unique. It sounds the same as tone 3 but it behaves differently from all the single digit tones in that it does not undergo tone change. I established the Learn Penang Hokkien Facebook group as an online language laboratory where words are discussed among Hokkien speaking enthusiasts before they are added into the Penang Hokkien dictionary. Over the course of 10 years, the writing system that I created gained acceptance as an easy way to write and read Penang Hokkien. I even held a Penang Hokkien story writing competition in 2021 where entries have to be submitted in Taiji romanization. I was astonished that participants could write in the writing system I have created. On 5th July 2023, the Penang Chief Minister launched the Penang Hokkien Dictionary and Learn Penang Hokkien YouTube channel at a ceremony at Town Hall. It was the culmination of 10 years of work, of sweat and of tears. I could never have imagined being recognised for the work I've done for no other reason than to ensure the survival of my mother tongue.
recognition from the Penang State Government provided an injection of interest in learning Penang Hokkien and following that, I was interviewed by various news media. Penang Hokkien has always been a spoken language. It was able to survive in that manner as long as society communicates largely in oral form. But with the advent of social media, society transitions into the written form in order to communicate by email or over Facebook and WhatsApp. Without a proper writing system, Penang Hokkien could not survive. It needs to have a writing system of its own so that it can be used for creating soft assets such as stories, songs, jokes and movies. The development of our local culture requires that this language can be written down every time there is a need to write it. I know that the growth of Penang Hokkien will be limited if I keep the writing system to myself. For that reason, I have created the Penang Hokkien Train the Trainer course so that I can pass my knowledge to others who will then spread it to more people. If you are interested to learn Penang Hokkien, in order that you can teach others, whether free of charge or through fee charging classes, get in touch with me and I will train you. Training is conducted individually over WhatsApp, so you can join regardless where in the world you happen to be. This video that you are presently watching is itself part 4 of section 1 of the Train the Trainer course. It is the final lesson of section 1 which covers the basics of Penang Hokkien before the participants continue to section 2. As we come to the conclusion of this video, I want to thank you for watching it to the end and I look forward to your watching the next video from Learn Penang Hokkien. To learn more about Penang Hokkien, please subscribe to this channel and look at the other videos that are already published. Until we meet again, thanks for watching.